Welcome to the next podcast in our boot camp series. And my apologies that you're listening to me today instead of Paul, but he asked me to do this one solo. Today, we're going to be talking about the best in class ETFs. And basically, we're going to shift from where you've been up until this point, which is looking with Paul at historical performance and underlying investment principles and theory and portfolio selection uh, through accumulation, distribution, a whole bunch of really good stuff that's gotten you here. We're going to transition from that into the practical aspects of implementation. So assuming you've followed Paul so far, you've gotten to the point that you have an idea of a buy and hold investing strategy that you'd like to follow. Maybe it's a, a two fund S&P 500 plus small cap value approach. Maybe it's the ultimate buy and hold with 13 funds, including the 10 equity asset classes and, and three bond funds. Whatever your choice is, you got to go shopping now. It's kind of an interesting point in the process where you go from looking at these historical theoretical asset classes to the rubber meets the road. You need to look in your 401k maybe and figure out what funds are available and uh, and or maybe you go to a brokerage and try and figure out what's available there. And then you trade your money. You trade your money for shares in an ETF or a mutual fund. Ideally, it's going to be a low cost index fund that represents these asset classes we've been talking about so far. But how do you do that? How can you be a knowledgeable shopper when you're making this transaction? And I thought it would be useful to use an analogy to look at something that is, is out of category, out of personal finance that we can all relate to. Uh, personally, I have a... Uh, some would call it an addiction. I'm going to call it a preference for Diet Coke. So that's something I shop for on a regular basis. But you could substitute whatever your favorite beverage is. And I like in the morning to have straight Diet Coke that's got caffeine in it, no calories, and I'd like to pay a reasonable price. So if I go shopping, I am met with a lot of information. Uh, some of it obvious, some of it less less obvious. Uh, obviously, there's a logo on it. I could buy generic or I could buy name brand, and that tells me something about the quality and the attributes of what's inside. There's a price on it, and that price might just be the, the total price, or if I'm lucky and I'm at a grocery store, I can look at the unit price. I can look at the price I'm paying per ounce of soda that I'm getting. This morning while I was out for my morning walk and seeking one of these sodas, I actually did a little bit of research. So at the grocery store, I went by a 12, uh, a, well, a 10 pack of 10 ounce mini cans was 10 cents per ounce. A 12 pack of 12 ounce cans was 7.7 .7 cents per ounce. A two liter Diet Coke was 7.9 cents per ounce. And if I was willing to go with Coke Zero, a little bit different, it's still name brand quality, but a little bit different flavor, I could get it down to 5.3 uh, cents per ounce in the uh, two liter. But I also have an option to go generic. I could go generic and get the Safeway Signature Select two liter for 2.3 cents per ounce. So now, now we're getting into something that's sounding a little bit like a deal, but I got to give up quality. I don't know if I want to do that. And down the street though, 7-Eleven will sell me an on tap soda for a dollar and they'll give me the seventh one free. And that brings it to 3.12 cents per ounce. So now I'm getting into generic prices. And finally, the Chevron I pass in the morning will sell me uh, a similar kind of buy six, get the seventh free at 79 cents for a 32 ounce Diet Coke. And that gets me to 2.1 cents per ounce. So here I would say the best in class purchase of Diet Coke is at my local Chevron. So cheers. Um, I got my Chevron Diet Coke. Now, when we're in the world of investing, if you go into your 401k, it's not going to be that simple. Uh, unfortunately, what you're going to find is that the companies give their funds fancy names, and it's not always easy to tell what's inside. If you're lucky, 
the price, the price that you pay, which is going to be the expense ratio, that should be pretty obvious because <clears throat> that is one of the most important predictors of future returns. You really want to have a low cost set of funds, ones that have low expense ratio. But the fund name is not going to tell you anything about what's inside. And so to be a knowledgeable shopper, we need to know two things. Number one, what, what are the attributes we care about when we're picking these funds? And number two, where can we find out information about them? So the first thing that the attributes that matter, you've kind of gotten a clue by following Paul's work so far. It's, <clears throat> first of all, you've got stocks versus bonds. The risk that we take by investing in the stock market comes with an expected higher return. So that's called the market risk factor or the, 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 uh, the market attribute, if you will, of these funds. So you want funds that are, if you're buying a fund in the equity portion of your portfolio, you want it to be mostly stocks inside. The second thing is that Paul has taught you so far that the smaller companies in the market tend to grow a little bit faster. The out of favor or the value companies tend to grow a little bit faster. And there are other attributes too that matter, but it's harder to shop for those. So for example, <clears throat> companies that have been going up in value tend to keep going up in value. That's called the momentum attribute or part of the market. Companies with higher quality financials tend to do better. But where do we find out all of this information about these funds? Well, I'm going to suggest a resource. And those of you who are listening on the podcast won't see this. Those of you who are here with me on the YouTube video, though, I'm going to share a web browser. And we're going to go to the Morningstar website. And the Morningstar website is available for free and really a fantastic resource for investors. And if we go to that website, it's just Morningstar.com, and we type in a fund name like uh, we'll take a Vanguard Small Cap Value Fund, V-I-O-V, and uh, we, we hit carriage return there. Uh, it's going to bring up a bunch of information about this fund. And you can see on this screen that it's going to tell us uh, some, some very valuable things. Perhaps the most valuable on this first page is the adjusted expense ratio at 0.15% per year. Man, we live in amazing times. To be able to buy a collection of small cap value stocks and have it managed for you responsibly by a company that is owned by their investors, Vanguard, for 0.15% per year is a deal. That's that's a steal. Um, it's also going to tell you the the relative size of the the fund, the total value of its assets, um, 1.4 billion. It's going to tell you what the yield has been historically, how it trades, what its price is. But what we really want to know is how it compares on these attributes that drive performance. So for that information, if we click on this link here called Portfolio, we now get a screen that shows us some very interesting things. It tells us that 99% of this fund is in the U.S., which is exactly what you would expect for a U.S. small cap value fund. It tells us that there's almost no fixed income and only 0.9% cash in here, which is good. You don't want a lot of cash in your equity fund. Um, it tells us over here on this on the right hand side in a set of style boxes how big the companies are that are in this fund. That's on the vertical axis, and these are small companies. That's good. Uh, it also tells us how valuey they are. They're right squarely in the value box. That's good. And it shows us this kind of ellipse, this, this picture of how broadly spread out they are. And uh, it's a broad distribution around that center point in small cap value. So, so everything's looking really good so far. And you can come down here to the right and you can see that the price to book for this fund is 1.22 compared to the category average of 1.35. That's good. You can look at the size of the companies by clicking market cap. The average market cap in this fund is $2 billion, uh, versus the category average of $4.2 billion. 
So you can think of this as it's like that dietary label on the side of the Diet Coke can that tells you how many calories are in there. It also tells you, you know, the nutritional value of it. But um, pulling all these numbers out individually is a little tricky. So instead, they have also provided this really useful tool here on the left hand side that's like a, a set of thermometer scales going up and down. And using that, we can see that this is value is it's tilted towards the value part of the market, which is what we want. It's got a reasonably high yield that that's kind of neither here nor there, especially if you reinvest the dividends. Uh, I, ideally, I'd rather have low yield because the yield can trigger taxes that I don't really want for a long term investor, but it's hard to get that in a small cap value fund. Uh, the momentum on this one is low. That's a negative. That's not great. The quality on this one is low. That's a negative. That's not great. Uh, volatility on this is high, which is sort of expected in small cap value. Uh, liquidity is high and size is small, which is what we want. So we can use this set of kind of thermometer scales, or you can think of it as, like I said, that ingredients label and do a comparison. So let's add a second tab here in Morningstar. And in this second tab, I'm going to put in our best in class recommendation, which is Avantis AVUV. Now, the first thing you notice is that the expense ratio is higher. It's 0.25%. Well, 0.25%, that's 10 basis points or 10 one hundredths of a percent higher than the other one. That's, that's not good. But if we're getting better ingredients, maybe it's worth it. So let's take a look at that same portfolio tab over here and scroll to where we can compare. And now we can click back and forth between these two. And what you're going to notice are some significant differences. Now, again, for those of you on a podcast, I'll just call them out and you'll, you'll get it quick. So the first thing you're going to notice is that <clears throat> both of these are small and value, which is good. The second thing, though, that you'll notice is that momentum for the AVUV fund, the Avantis fund, is much better. And momentum is a driver, a historic driver of performance or, or higher returns. The other thing is the quality is quite a bit higher. So... Those two attributes historically have actually been worth quite a lot. And the fact that we're getting a fund at only a slightly higher price, but with these much better attributes might mean that it's going to deliver a higher return. The question is, how much are these attributes worth? And that requires a little bit more analysis. Now we're getting to the point that like with my Diet Coke analogy, you have to do some math. But before we go there, I think Morningstar is wise to present the information in this relatively simple way. I think that practically speaking, most investors will not go much beyond this. And in many cases, investors will be restricted to a limited range of choices anyway. So for an investor who's not willing to do the math that I'm about to explain to you, they could look at this and say, well, a fund that has significantly higher momentum, better quality, is that worth 0.1% per year? And I think most investors would say yes. Some would not, and that's fine. You have to make a decision that you feel comfortable with. As you'll see in a minute, though, I think you can make a very strong case mathematically using some numbers for that being true. So the next step then is, well, how do we figure out how much each of these ingredients is worth? And for that piece of information, I'm going to suggest that you go to another website, which is called PortfolioVisualizer.com. And if we go to there, there's a page called Factor Statistics, and it's in the Factor Analysis box. And what this tells us is very specifically how much these attributes, these different qualities of the market have been worth in the past. Now, one of the things you'll find is that there are a lot of different models. There's uh, many different ways to model and characterize past historical performance. 
I tend to use the Fama French five factor model for two reasons. Number one, it's academically motivated. It doesn't come from somebody with uh, a mixed agenda. Uh, it doesn't come from a company trying to sell me anything. And number two, I like it because the five factor model accounts for a very high percentage of the attributes uh, or the historical performance of stocks in the market. And over here, you see this annualized return. It tells you what these different attributes or risk factors have been worth in the past. So the market risk factor, the benefit that we have gotten historically for taking the risk of equities, of stocks, has been worth 5.67% above risk-free. Now, what's risk-free? Risk-free would be the return you would have expected or gotten historically from, say, something like a one-month government T-bill or bond. That historically has been about 3 or 4%. So what that says is that over this period of time, you would have gotten about 9.7% just from investing in the market. And that lines up pretty well with the historical returns that Paul has shown you before. So that's, that's what these mean. I use the five-factor model. So if you look at the size FF5, it tells you that in the five-factor model, size has been worth about 2.1%, 2.07 is what the screen says. The value factor has been worth about 2.94%. And then there are two others that I include when I do my analysis uh, in the five-factor model. One is the um, conservative minus aggressive, which is investment. Uh, and then there's a quality one, um, which is rich minus weak or profitability. And the profitability has been worth about 3%. And the uh, conservative minus aggressive has been a bit worth about 3.1%. So you have each of these attributes. It seems obvious. What would you want to find in in a, an ideal fund, you'd want something that gave you 100% exposure to all of them, right? That would, that would be ideal. Well, it turns out that as you reach for one of these attributes in the market, you often give up one of the others. So how are we going to find out how much a fund exposure gives us? Well, if we go to this other category I mentioned from the Portfolio Visualizer webpage of fund factor regressions, uh, we can choose this five-factor model that I mentioned, and we update this table, and it shows you all of the United States funds or all of the international developed funds or all of the international ex-US funds. You, you can pick them, and it tells you for each of those funds how much you get of each of these attributes. So you get the market, the size, the value, which is high minus low rich minus weak and conservative minus aggressive. And uh, let's say we wanted value, that that's our really big thing, right? So we'll, we'll go for how much exposure could we get to value? And you can click on these little arrows to sort by that. The highest exposure you can get to value in any one fund is 0.82 or 82%. You can't get the whole factor. Uh, size, let's take a look at that. If you look at size, the highest you can get is actually there. You can get more. You get 136% or 1.36. And the reason is it's probably a micro cap fund and it may even be a leveraged fund that gives you that. Um, rich minus weak. It, it will actually look here for just a second. As I selected size, you notice that the value went down for the, the fund that gives you the most exposure to size. So you can actually download all of this information, and I do. That's how I do my best-in-class ETF analysis. And basically what you do is you multiply the exposure you get to each of these attributes times what they have been worth historically. At least that's the way I analyze it. And I add them up, and it tells me if the future looks like the past, and if the fund is managed in a consistent way, what would I expect to get? And then I use that to compare between these funds. I don't use it to set my expectations of what return I'm going to get in the future. I just use it to say, 
is this fund giving me meaningful exposure to the small part of the market, the value part of the market, the, um, the, the market at large, uh, is it giving me quality stocks and, and what are each of those worth? And is it worth more than the expense ratio I'm going to pay? Because you can subtract that out. Now there's one other attribute here that's worthwhile talking to just briefly. And that's this, uh, it's called R squared. Um, and what it tells you is how good is the model at explaining past performance. So if you have a Wizard of Oz type scenario, there's somebody behind the curtain who's second guessing the market and doing market timing and things, you would expect that fund to drift over time and have different exposure to different attributes at different points in time, and it would have a low R squared value. If on the other hand, the fund is being managed in a very systematic way, and consistently over time, then I would expect that to have a high R squared value. So if I click the greater than 95% and I update the table, it'll get rid of a lot of actively managed funds. And I do this before I download the funds that we analyze because I really only want systematically managed funds that are essentially like a low cost index fund, whether they're labeled as such or not. So that's the gist of how I do the math. And I have written an AAII article on this. I have uh, uh, done a deeper YouTube, uh, YouTube video on it that I can link. I'll link to both of those for people who want to know more. Uh, but the simple path forward for a lot of you is going to be to go to the website, to go to paulmerriman.com. Uh, and if you look on the website under portfolios, and then go down to best in class ETFs, you'll find a link to the article that I update every other year that describes for each of these asset classes, what our best in class fund recommendation is, as well as a bunch of alternative recommendations that are selected with the thought in mind that sometimes you will be limited to a particular family of funds. And so you can see going down that list, all of the funds that we recommend for the asset classes that Paul has talked about so far. U.S. large cap blend is the Avantis U.S. equity fund, AVUS. U.S. large cap value is Invesco's S&P 500 pure value RPV. U.S. small cap blend is IJR. U.S. small cap value is Avantis AVUV. And you can go right down the list and if you trust my analysis and you have access to these funds, uh, you can use them. But keep in mind, there is no guarantee that those funds will give you the best performance over the next day, year, month, even decade. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of luck involved. But I, I feel very comfortable recommending these funds because they're based on an objective analysis that I think is useful uh, in giving us a higher likelihood of outperformance in the future. The other thing I wanted to point out on Paul's website is if you look in portfolios, there's something called the portfolio configurator. And if you go to the portfolio configurator, you can take any one of the strategies Paul's talked about, like the ultimate buy and hold 50, 50 U S and international. You can pick a tax status tax deferred uh, is what I'll pick here. You can set a fixed income percentage. We'll go 20% um, uh, fixed income. And then you can pick a fund family. So you can say best in class ETFs. And what it lets you do is it lets you using that strategy and that set of choices quickly list the funds that we recommend uh, for best in class ETFs and the percentages that you would use to implement that portfolio. It goes a step farther and it analyzes that portfolio to tell you what the overall expense ratio is that you end up with, what the price to earnings ratio is for that portfolio. Um, these are all analyzed as of last year because that's when I updated the statistics. Um, the yield that you that you would would have gotten at that point in time, 
uh, the U.S. international split and emerging markets. The thing I find interesting is like if we if we look at where this best in class portfolio it ends ends up, it's it ends up tilted quite a bit as you would expect to uh, small in value. So you end up with a mid cap value kind of overall portfolio orientation. If I deselect best in class, now you can see that it actually is the smallest and the most value -y or the most discounted of all of the fund families that we recommend. You can uh, select the Vanguard family and see where that puts you at. It's a little bit larger and a little bit less value -y. Uh, you can look at the mutual funds. They should be almost the same. They're a little bit larger in this case because we recommend funds that aren't exactly the same as the ETFs. You can look at Fidelity. You can just click on through. So I think this is a really useful tool to give you just one more perspective on it all. So uh, just a couple of additional thoughts uh, before we leave here. One of them is that, you know, I want to reiterate, there are no guarantees here. I've given you my approach to picking these funds to be a smart shopper when you're investing in funds. I've given you my recommendations for best in class ETFs. In many respects, what's most important is that you believe in the process that you use, because as a buy and hold investor, one of the best things we can do is hold. If you're constantly trading in and out of different funds, that's going to incur expenses and costs, uh, not the least of which are behavioral, where you're second guessing yourself and doubting your past decisions. So I, I think that's really important. Remember, there are no guarantees. It's important you feel comfortable with it and find something that you can live with for a long time. The other thing is think about taxes. Uh, it can cost money to change from the fund that you're in, whatever that is, into a new fund. And if the difference is small, it may not pay back for a decade or more. Uh, so sometimes it's best just to hold with what you got. And Daryl likes to use this quote. I do too. Uh, Perfect is the enemy of good enough. In a lot of respects, the differences between the individual funds doesn't matter as much as the difference between the portfolio allocations. So how much you have in equities versus bonds is a really big decision. How much you have in small versus large and value versus blend, that's a big decision. How much you have in which fund, that is out of those three, one of the smallest decisions provided they're all low cost index funds with reasonable exposure to the attributes that you're looking for. So uh, yeah, remember perfect is the enemy of good enough and it, don't get, don't get stalled. If you get stuck, um, it, it can keep you out of the market too long and time in the market is what really pays the bills for us. So with that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who listen to what we say. Uh, thank you for providing comments and questions that helps with the YouTube algorithms. And it helps us to understand where there are gaps in our teaching and where we could do a better job. And I wish you all the best of luck and good shopping and look forward to meeting you again soon in the next video I'm going to do, which is on two funds for life. Thanks again.